Okay, so in this short video, we're going to introduce Chernoff bounds. Chernoff bounds are a really important and useful tool in the analysis of randomized algorithms. I personally use them all of the time in my own research. So let's get into it. So as a motivating example for Chernoff bounds, let's consider the same coin flipping example that we looked at when we talked about Markov's and Chebyshev's inequalities. Recall that we were trying to bound the probability that x, the number of heads after flipping a fair coin n times, was greater than or equal to 3n over 4. Markov's inequality said that this probability was at most 2 thirds, while Chebyshev's inequality said that this probability was at most 4 over n. So Chebyshev's inequality was better than Markov's here, but we could hope to do better still. In particular, we can get some intuition from the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says that sums of independent, identically distributed random variables with bounded variance converge to a Gaussian. In this picture, here's the PDF of x, at least when n equals 50, and the central limit theorem says that for big enough n, it should look a lot like the PDF of a Gaussian. So why should this give us any intuition about tail bounds? Well, consider the probability that x is bigger than some threshold, let's say here. This probability is given by the mass in the distribution over here. We'd hope that this mass here is similar to the corresponding mass in the Gaussian, here. But we know what Gaussian tails look like, and if we work it out, this gives us the intuition that the probability that x is greater than or equal to 3n over 4 is going to be exponentially small in n. In the rest of this video, we'll prove that this intuition is in fact correct using Chernoff bounds. So Chernoff bounds actually refers to a family of tail bounds, all of which are proved by applying Markov's inequality to the moment generating function. In more detail, we have that for any t greater than zero, the probability that a random variable x is greater than or equal to some threshold c, this is equal to the probability that e to the t x is greater than or equal to e to the t times c, and applying Markov's inequality, we see that this is at most the moment generating function of x, the expected value of e to the t x, divided by e to the t c. Similarly, for any t less than zero, the probability that x is at most c is equal to the probability that e to the tx is greater than or equal to e to the tc. Here we've used the fact that t is negative to switch the direction of the inequality. And again, by Markov's inequality, this is at most the expected value of e to the tx, that is the moment generating function of x, divided by e to the tc. Now, notice that this top statement holds for any t greater than zero, while this bottom statement holds for any t less than zero. So our strategy is going to be to pick the t that's going to give us the best bound possible. So here is a prototypical Chernoff bound. Suppose that x is the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi, where xi is a Bernoulli random variable with parameter pi, that is xi is equal to 1 with probability pi and 0 otherwise. The xi are independent, and let's define mu to be equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of pi. So notice that mu is just the expected value of x. Then, this is a theorem, for any delta greater than 0, the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1 plus delta times mu, that is the probability that x is just a little bit bigger than its expectation, multiplicatively speaking, is at most e to the delta divided by 1 plus delta to the 1 plus delta, all raised to the mu. This might look a little bit messy, but we'll dig into it in a moment. On the flip side, we also have a bound that x is much smaller than its expectation. For any delta greater than a 0, the probability that x is less than or equal to 1 minus delta times mu is at most e to the minus delta divided by 1 minus delta to the 1 minus delta, all raised to the mu. So before we prove this theorem, let's illustrate it with our coin flipping example. I've written uh, one part of the conclusion up here so we can still look at it. So let's return to this coin flipping example where x is the number of heads after flipping a fair coin n times. 
In this case, the Chernoff bound that we just saw says that the probability that x is greater than or equal to 3n over 4, okay, so we could just rewrite this as the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1 plus 1 half times the expected value of x. Here I'm using the fact that the expected value of x is n over 2, and that n over 2 times 3 halves happens to be equal to 3n over 4. So now we want to apply our Chernoff bound. We have that mu equals n over 2, that's the expectation, and delta equals 1 half. Applying our Chernoff bound, we see that the probability that x is bigger than 3n over 4 is at most, okay, so e to the delta, that's the square root of e, divided by 1 plus delta to the 1 plus delta, that's 3 halves to the 3 halves, all raised to the mu, which is n over 2. Okay, so this is a pretty gross expression, but I put it into my computer and it turns out that this is approximately equal to 0.897 dot 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 raised to the n over 2. In particular, this is indeed decreasing exponentially in n, which matches our intuition from the central limit theorem. So now let's prove this Chernoff bound. We're going to start with the first part, the upper bound. First, recall from the previous video that if x is the sum of the xi's, uh, as here, this is our setup, then the moment generating function of x is given by the product over i of 1 plus pi times e to the t minus 1. Using the fact that 1 plus x is always less than or equal to e to the x, we can bound this by the product over i of e to the pi times e to the t minus 1. The product becomes a summation in the exponent so this is just equal to e to the mu times e to the t minus 1, recalling that mu is equal to the sum of the pi's. Now, for any c, we have that the probability that x is greater than or equal to c is at most the expected value of e to the tx divided by e to the tc. This is this trick with Markov's inequality that we saw at the beginning of this video. So now plugging in the bound that we just got on the moment generating function, this is at most e to the mu times e to the t minus 1 minus tc, and this holds for any t greater than 0. Now, let's plug in 1 plus delta times mu for c. We see that the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1 plus delta times mu is at most e to the mu times e to the t minus 1 minus t times 1 plus delta. At this point, we get to choose t however we like, as long as it's greater than zero. So let's choose t equal to the log of one plus delta. And since one plus delta is greater than one, t is greater than zero. Then this simplifies as e to the mu times delta minus one plus delta times log one plus delta, which is equal to e to the delta over one plus delta to the one plus delta all to the mu, which is exactly the expression we got on the previous slide. So this proves the upper bound part of that theorem. Check. Now let's prove the lower bound. You can check that if we follow the exact same logic as on the previous slide, we get that the probability that x is less than or equal to 1 minus delta times mu is at most e to the mu times e to the t minus 1 minus t times 1 minus delta for any t less than 0. Here the only thing that's different is that instead of a 1 plus delta here and here I have a 1 minus delta and now t has to be less than 0 instead of greater than 0. Once again we get to choose t however we like as long as it's less than 0. So let's choose t equal to the log of 1 minus delta. Now since 1 minus delta is less than 1 the log is less than 0 so that checks out. Plugging this in this bound is equal to e to the mu times minus delta minus 1 minus delta log 1 minus delta, which can be rewritten as e to the minus delta divided by 1 minus delta to the 1 minus delta to the mu. So this proves the lower bound of the theorem. Check. Okay, so both of those bounds looked pretty messy. Fortunately, they can be simplified. The result is bounds that are not quite as tight, but that are much easier to apply. So here are a few of them. So same setup as before, x is the sum of the xi's, where the xi's are independent Bernoulli random variables. Then, for any delta in 0, 1, the probability that x 
is greater than or equal to 1 plus delta times mu is at most e to the minus mu times delta squared divided by 3. And similarly, for any delta in 0, 1, the probability that x is much smaller than its expectation, that it's smaller than 1 minus delta times mu, is at most e to the minus mu times delta squared divided by 2. One other bound that's useful if you're wondering what is the probability that x is way bigger than its expectation is for any c greater than or equal to 6, the probability that x is greater than or equal to c times mu is at most 2 to the minus c times mu. We're not going to prove these simpler bounds here, but they follow from the bounds that we proved before by just bounding those expressions above by these expressions. Actually, it's a good exercise to try to prove these yourself, or at least to plot these expressions and the corresponding expressions from the previous theorem for various values of mu and delta, and convince yourself that these ones are always bigger. If nothing else, you'll get a better sense of the behavior of those messier expressions that we got earlier. To illustrate one of these simpler bounds, this one up here, let's return to this coin flipping example that we had earlier. So once again, x is the number of heads after flipping a fair coin n times, and we're interested in the probability that x is greater than or equal to 3n over 4. So once again, this is equal to the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1 plus 1 half times mu. So I should take delta equal to 1 half. And if I apply the simpler Chernoff bound up here, this says that this is at most e to the minus n over 2 times 1 half squared divided by 3, also known as e to the minus n divided by 24. So this still gets the same qualitative result as before, something inversely exponential in n, but it's much easier to apply. Another useful corollary is that you can still use Chernoff bounds even if you only have a bound on the expectation of x but don't know it exactly. So here I've just copied and pasted the theorem we had before, but now suppose that you don't actually know what mu is, you just know that it's at most some bound c. Then we can edit this conclusion to remove the mu here and just write a c wherever mu appears and write for any c greater than or equal to mu. So this says that I can just throw in c, my bound on mu, instead of mu, and I still get a perfectly valid statement. Similarly, if I know that mu is greater than or equal to some c, then I can edit this statement here to just throw in c instead of mu and write for any c less than or equal to mu. So let's see a quick proof, at least of the first statement. So suppose that c is greater than or equal to mu, and let's define some random variables yi, which are independent Bernoulli qi random variables. That is, they're 1 with probability qi and 0 otherwise. So that the sum over i of the qi's is equal to c minus mu. We can do this since c is bigger than mu. Now, let z be the sum over i of the xi plus the sum over i of the yi. Then the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1 plus delta times c is at most the probability that z is greater than or equal to 1 plus delta times c. This is because z is always at least x because we just got z by adding a bunch of non-negative stuff to x. But now we can apply our earlier turn off bound to z and conclude that this is at most e to the delta divided by 1 plus delta to the 1 plus delta all to the c. So this proves this first statement here, and the second statement is pretty similar. There are several other useful Chernoff-like bounds which come from different ways of choosing the parameter t and or of bounding the nasty expression that comes out. For reference, here are a few of them. The first is a Chernoff bound with additive error. So the setup for this is exactly the same as the setup that we were considering before. But now, instead of being interested in the probability that x is bigger than some 1 plus delta times its expectation, I'm interested in the probability that x is bigger than its expectation plus some additive delta. If we think of delta as scaling linearly in n, then delta squared divided by n also scales linearly in n, and this whole expression is decreasing exponentially in n, as we had before. 
The next useful inequality is Hufting's inequality. This setting is similar to the one we were looking at, but instead of the xi being 0, 1 random variables, we can generalize to the xi being any random variables in some bounded interval. So xi needs to be in the interval ai bi. In this case, the probability that x deviates from its expectation by more than delta can be bounded by this expression. So this looks similar to the expression that we had up here for the additive error, except that in the denominator, we now have something in terms of the width of the intervals that the xi are bounded in. Finally, we come to Bernstein's inequality. Bernstein's inequality is useful when the random variables xi have reasonably small variance. It says that if the xi are mean zero, so that their absolute value is bounded by some parameter m, then the probability that their sum is not too large is bounded by this expression, where the sum of the variances of the xi appear in the denominator. So if the xi's have small variance, this can be a big win. I'm not going to prove these bounds in this video, but I just wanted to put them here for reference, since they can be really useful in different situations. It's a really good exercise to try to prove these starting from the Markov applied to moment generating function approach. Okay, so that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.